Part 7, The Complete Duden Dictionary and Thesaurus, featuring Champagne and Accordions, a trilogy, some sirens, a sky stealer, an offer, the long walk to Dachau, peace, an idiot, and some coat men. Champagne and Accordions. In the summer of 1942, the town of Mulking was preparing for the inevitable. There were still people who refused to believe that this small town on Munich's outskirts could be a target, but the majority of the population was well aware that it was not a question of if, but when. Shelters were more clearly marked, windows were in the process of being blackened for the night, and everyone knew where the closest basement or cellar was. For Hans Habermann, this uneasy development was actually a slight reprieve. At an unfortunate time, good luck had somehow found its way into his painting business. People with blinds were desperate enough to enlist his services to paint them. His problem was that black paint was normally used more as a mixer to darken other colors, and it was soon depleted and hard to find. What he did have was the knack of being a good tradesman, and a good tradesman has many tricks. He took coal dust and stirred it through, and he worked cheap. There were many houses in all parts of Molking in which he confiscated the window light from enemy eyes. On some of his work days, Liesel went with him. They carted his paint through town, smelling the hunger on some of the streets and shaking their heads at the wealth on others. Many times, on the way home, women with nothing but kids and poverty would come running out and plead with him to paint their blind. Frau Halle, I'm sorry, I have no black paint left, he would say, but a little farther down the road, he would always break. There was tall man and long street. Tomorrow, he'd promised, first thing. And when the next morning dawned, there he was, painting those blinds for nothing, or for a cookie or a warm cup of tea. The previous evening, he'd have found another way to turn blue or green or beige to black. Never did he tell them to cover their windows with spare blankets, for he knew they'd need them when winter came. He was even known to paint people's blinds for half a cigarette, sitting on the front step of a house, sharing a smoke with the occupant. Laughter and smoke rose out of the conversation before they moved on the ne- to the next job. When the next time, when the time came to write, I remember clearly what Liesel Memminger had to say about that summer. A lot of the words have faded over the decades. The paper has suffered from the friction of the movement in my pocket, but still, many of her sentences have been impossible to forget. A small sample of some girl-written words. That summer was a new beginning, a new end. When I look back, I remember my slippery hands of paint and the sound of Papa's feet on Munich Street, and I know that a small piece of the summer of 1942 belonged to only one man. Who else would do some painting for the price of half a cigarette? That was Papa. That was typical, and I loved him. Every day when they worked together, he would tell Liesel his stories. There was the Great War and how his miserable handwriting helped save his life, and the day he met Mama. He said that she was beautiful once, and actually very quiet-spoken. Hard to believe, I know, but absolutely true. Each day there was a story, and Liesel forgave him if he told the same one more than once. On other occasions, when she was daydreaming, Papa would dab her lightly with his brush right between the eyes. If he misjudged and there was too much of it, a small path of paint would dribble down the side of her nose. She would laugh and try to return the favor, but Hans Habermann was a hard man to catch out at work. It was there that he was most alive. When they had a break to eat or drink, he would play the accordion, and it was this that Liesel remembered best. Each morning, while Papa pushed or dragged the paint cart, Liesel carried the instrument. Better that we leave the paint behind, Hans told her, than ever forget the music. When they paused to eat, he would cut up the bread, smearing it with what little jam remained from the last ration card, or he'd lay a small slice of meat on top of it. They would eat together, sitting on their cans of paint, and with the last mouthful still in their chewing stages, Papa would be wiping his fingers, unbuckling the accordion case. Traces of breadcrumbs were in the creases of his overalls. Paint-specked hands made their way across the buttons and raked over the keys, or held on to a note for a while. His arms worked the bellows, giving the instrument the air it needed to breathe. Liesel would sit each day with her hands between her knees, in the long legs of daylight. She wanted none of those days to end and it was always with disappointment that she watched the darkness stride forward. As far as the painting itself was concerned, probably the most interesting aspect for Liesel was the mixing. Like most people, she assumed her papa simply took his cart to the paint shop or hardware store and asked for the right color and away he went. She didn't realize that most of his paint was in lumps 
in the shape of a brick. It was then rolled out with an empty champagne bottle. Champagne bottles, Hans explained, were ideal for the job, as their glass was slightly thicker than that of an ordinary bottle of wine. That was, Once that was completed, there was the addition of water, whiting, and glue, not to mention the complexities of matching the right color. The science of Papa's trade brought him an even greater level of respect. It was well and good to share bread and music, but it was nice for Liesl to know that he was also more than capable in his occupation. Competence was attractive. One afternoon, a few days after Papa's explanation of the mixing, they were working at one of the wealthier houses just east of Munich Street. Papa called Liesl inside in the early afternoon. They were just about to move on to another job when she heard the unusual volume in his voice. Once inside, she was taken to the kitchen where two older women and a man sat on delicate, highly civil chairs. The women were well-dressed. The man had white hair and sideburns, like hedges. Tall glasses stood on the table. They were filled with crackling liquid. Well, said the man, here we go. He took up his glass and urged the others to do the same. The afternoon had been warm. Liesl was slightly put off by the coolness of her glass. She looked at Papa for approval. He grinned and said, Prost, my doll. Cheers, girl. Their glasses chimed together, and the moment Liesl raised it to her mouth, she was bitten by the fizzy, sickly sweet taste of champagne. Her reflexes forced her to spit straight onto her papa's overalls, watching it foam and dribble. A shout of laughter followed from all of them, and Hans encouraged her to give it another try. On the second attempt, she was able to swallow it and enjoy the taste of a glorious broken rule. It felt great. The bubbles ate her tongue. They prickled her stomach. Even as they walked to the next job, she could feel the warmth of pins and needles inside her. Dragging the cart, Papa told her that those people claimed to have no money. So you asked for champagne? Why not? He looked across and never had his eyes been so silver. I didn't want you thinking that champagne bottles are only used for rolling paint. He warned her. Just don't tell Mama. Agreed? Can I tell Max? Sure, you can tell Max. In the basement, when she wrote about her life, Liesl vowed that she would never drink champagne again, for it would never taste as good as it did on that warm afternoon in July. It was the same with accordions. Many times, she wanted to ask her papa if he might teach her to play, but somehow, something always stopped her. Perhaps an unknown intuition told her that she would never be able to play, like, play it like Hans Huberman. Surely, not even the world's greatest accordionists could compare. They could never be equal to the casual concentration on Papa's face. Or there wouldn't be a paintwork traded cigarette slouched on the player's lips. And they could never make a small mistake with a three-note laugh of hindsight. Not the way he could. At times, in that basement, she woke up tasting the sound of the accordion in her ears. She could feel the sweet burn of champagne on her tongue. Sometimes, she sat against the wall longing for the warm finger of paint to wander just once more down the side of her nose, or to watch the sandpaper texture of her papa's hands. If only she could be so oblivious again, to feel such love without knowing it, mistaking it for laughter and bread with only the scent of jam spread out on top of it. It was the best time of her life. But it was bombing carpet, make no mistake. Bold and bright, a trilogy of happiness would continue for summer's duration and into autumn, it would then be brought abruptly to an end, for the brightness had shown suffering the way. Hard times were coming, like a parade. Student Dictionary Meaning Number 1 Zoo fried in height, happiness, coming from happy, enjoying pleasure and contentment. Related words, joy, gladness, feeling fortunate or prosperous.